let us begin. All right, bottom of page 29. I am there. All right, shall we? Hang on, I gotta think of what I'm doing for Doc Murphy's voice here. Uh, <laughs> creaky old man? I, I tell you. Okay, I guess it's gonna have to be something high pitched like that and, and annoying. <laughs> <clears throat> God, Are I, you I really ready? should have prepped an old man's voice. Oh, well. It, okay, uh, everyone, let me get my face back on here. Uh, everyone watching, just uh, FYI, Doc Murphy's voice is subject to change going forward since I didn't prepare anything for it, and I'm not happy with what the performance I'm about to give. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Lower those expectations, hey, man. Hey, man. Under promise, under deliver. <laughs> I expect an amazing Doc Murphy. Here we go. Marty! <laughs> Not that. Doc. I know. All right. Great Scott. That's, that was terrible. Continue. Brian, Please. wait. <laughs> let me get to the right thing here. Here we go. Please begin. Exterior, Doc Murphy's. Late afternoon. The small clinic has... Okay. One option I see is Papa Murphy's. Yes. Hello, Siri. <laughs> All right. Ready to start? Let's do it again. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <sighs> this, Take it the, easy. this is the short episode, right? <laughs> this is <laughs> not if I could help it. <laughs> you know, I could edit this out because we're just looking at the script. But I think <laughs> this is further evidence of this being the best produced show on the internet. Absolutely. Well deserved reputation. <laughs> Exterior, Doc Murphy's, late afternoon. The small clinic has a large sign above the door that reads, Doctor's Office. Interior, Doc Murphy's, continuous. Doc Murphy, 60, a slight man with a kind face, finishes stitching Everett's scalp while Everett sits on the chair. Doc Murphy. I tell you to keep... Oh God, this is horrible. I'm just going to have to go with it. I tell you to keep a bandage on this, but I know you'll take... Uh, but I know... Uh, okay. Wow. One more time, Brian. One more time. From the top? No. <laughs> From me. Oh, okay. Here we go. Do Doc Murphy. <laughs> He's going to sound way too jovial <laughs> and giggly. <clears throat> I tell you to keep a bandage on this, but I know you'll just take it off. Just try to keep that hat over it as much as you can. Everett. Thanks, Doc. Can we move him? Everett motions over Doc's shoulder, and Doc turns to look at Long's unconscious body on a table. He's been bandaged. Doc Murphy. Well, I wouldn't advise it. He walks over to the table and lifts a small metal pot. A handful of ball bearings rattle around inside. Doc Murphy. I've dug out all the pellets and sutured his wounds, but he needs time to heal. Never seen a man survive buckshot. He sets the metal pod down and wipes his hands on a bloody rag draped over his shoulder. Stan, hunched over wa a washing basin to clean his wounds around his eyes, lifts his head to ch check his work in the mirror. Stan, if it were up to me, he wouldn't survive. Uh, you know what? Let me try that again. If it were up to me, he wouldn't survive. Everett, well, it's not up to you. Stan and Everett stare pointedly at each other in the mirror. Doc Murphy. Well, the ether won't keep him under forever. As long as he's laying down, I don't see why he couldn't rest in a cell. Everett. We'll take care of it. Claudette Murphy, 50, enters from the hallway. Claudette. Darling! Oh god, they sound the same in my head. <laughs> it's the same person! <clears throat> uh, how about we give her a little deeper voice? <clears throat> god. Darling. <laughs> no, so it's, is that Everett? I don't know. This is where... Let's get my face in here. Let's get my face in here, Brian. All right. This is where the limitations of an actor really are, are the limiting... Is the limiting factor to a performance. Yeah, man. Why can't you do 12 voices? Come on, man. Get it, get it straight. You know, if I, had, if I had rehearsed, if I had had time to rehearse, today was laundry day, sadly. I don't know if you can hear my dryer in the background. Absolutely can. That's what that is. You can hear that. Oh, yes, and I've okay. been trying to well, figure it out. 
Podcast Verite, everybody. These are the realities of a shoestring budget. <laughs> Bootstrap. Absolutely. I think that's We're what I'm hearing. Bootstraps. Claudette. Let's get back <clears throat> to Claudette here. <clears throat> All right. Darling. No, that's horrible. I'll just give it a regular voice. Darling. <laughs> Darling. The soldiers are leaving. Interior. Doc Murphy's. Hallway. Continuous. Doc follows her into the hallway, where three Union soldiers stand in uniform by the entrance. One of them is obviously sick as he shivers in the Arizona heat, hunched and pale. Doc Murphy. I'm sorry I couldn't do more for your friend. He's got symptoms I just can't understand. For a moment, the ill soldier flicks his gaze hungrily on Doc Murphy. His lips curl back into a mirthless grin, revealing unnaturally red and black gums. Taken aback by the evil visage, Doc Murphy swallows hard. A terrible shiver overtakes the yellow soldier, and the aggression drains from his body. Soldier number one. That's all right, Doc. We're taking him to Fort Bliss. I'm sure the army doctors can do something. Much obliged. The soldiers all, ma'am, to Claudette, before exiting and climbing onto a horse-drawn cart. The ill soldier lies down on the cart, pulling a blanket over himself. They ride off. Everett and Stan enter, carrying long on a stretcher. As they pass... Stan. Thanks, Doc. To Claudette. Ma'am. Everett. Ma'am. They exit. Exterior. Doc Murphy's continuous. Doc Murphy comes out with Stan and Everett. He stops when he sees Petrov. 40, the snake oil salesman, ride in with his horse-drawn carriage. The sign reads, Petrov's Potent Potables. Glassware rattles inside as it passes. Stan and Everett cross the wide street to the town jail. Close by, the bodies of the posse are being car carted to the undertaker. When the town folks see Long, they jeer Everett and Stan. The men move quickly into the jail. Interior, jail, continuous. The small building has only the basics, like a desk, table and chairs, a gun rack, and a large cell dominating the back of the room. A small solitary barred window allows some light into the cell. Stan and Everett carry Long into the cell. Stan drops Long unceremoniously. Long doesn't wake. Everett, that's no way to treat a prisoner. Stan, whatever you say, Marshal. After they exit the cell, Stan locks it. Everett drops Long's gun belt and coat onto the desk. Stan eyes the guns. Stan, what are you going to do with those pistols? Everett, noticing Stan's gaze. They're coming back with me as evidence. Stan sighs and begins to leave. Everett sits. Everett, where are you going? Stan, I'm getting a drink. Everett, you have a prisoner to watch. Wow, I totally should have fixed this, this dialogue, FYI. <laughs> he's not supposed to get a drink, he's supposed to go on patrol. Okay, here we go. Back to scene. Stan, <laughs> no, you have a prisoner to watch. I have a town to patrol. Everett watches him, then goes... And Everett watches him go, then looks at Long. Exterior, jail, continuous. Stan comes out and walks slowly down the street. He doesn't make eye contact with the townsfolk. A man on a horse-drawn cart rides slowly past. The man is beaten and bloody. Stan squints, recognizing him. Stan. Carl? Carl sees Stan and stops the horses. He looks at Stan with tears of rage burning in his eyes. There are corpses in the cart, and the cart is partially burned. Stan. What happened? Carl. Them goddamn Indians came out of nowhere, killed my kin, burned the wagons, they killed Molly, Sheriff. We gotta have some law out there. A look of determination falls across his face, and he rides off. Stan looks after him for a moment before chasing. He passes Petrov, who has opened his car to reveal his wares. He stands on a stool, waving his cloak and tipping his top hat. Petrov. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, come, come, feast your eyes on my wares that I bring to you from the remote parts of the world. Grabs green bottle. Here, water gathered from the Ganges River, blessed by a high priest. One sip of this holy water can extend your life for years. The crowd has grown around him, and an old man stands near the front, of the front next to Petrov. Petrov holds the bottle out to the old man, but pulls it back at the last moment. 
Petrov reaches for a lavender bottle and spots a homely woman. Petrov. Ah, but there's nothing compared to the power of this love potion. The homely woman perks up. Petrov. Drink this before bed, and when you wake up, your heart's desire will find you irresistible. The homely woman reaches for her coin purse. Doc Murphy. Don't give this man a penny. He's selling you snake oil. Petrov. Lies! I offer only the very best tonics and cordials from around the world. I've seen crippled men walk again after just one sip of my libations. Can you say the same, doctor? Doc Murphy. Charlatan! Petrov. To crowd. I look at all of you, and I see so much suffering. Let me ease your pain. If you have the coin, then I have the cure. He grabs bottles in both hands and gestures ostentatiously. The crowd rushes him with money in hand. Doc Murphy protests, but Claudette pulls him away. Petrov watches them go with glee. The old man from earlier tugs at him. Petrov. Ah, you must want the waters of life. Petrov takes his money and hands over the bottle. But before he lets go... Petrov. Careful, old man. Drink too much. You might never die. He winks, and the old man walks off, clutching the bottle. Interior, Doc Murphy's hallway. Moments later... Doc Murphy. It's a crime what he's doing. Claudette. Yes, but you have a patient. The two prospectors from earlier stand when Doc Murphy sees them. Prospector number two has a bite wound on his forearm. Interior, Doc Murphy's. Minutes later, Doc Murphy wraps the sutured wound. Doc Murphy. How did you say you got this hat? Whoa. How did you say this happened? Prospector number one. Oh, God. What was this guy's voice again? We have to keep the... Okay. Uh... We were walking back to our stake by Old Man Prophet's mine when we saw a dead dog in the road. Prospector number two. Well, we thought he was dead until he got up and bit me. Prospector number one. Took all I had to get it off him. I even broke its back with a stick. Funny. It couldn't move its legs no more, but it kept, but it kept looking at us, growling. Finally bashed its brains out. That did it. Doc Murphy. Oh, God. Doc Murphy and Prospector Number One, I think they're the same voice. I don't know. Here we go. Doc Murphy. Uh, you get it? <laughs> oh, Doc Murphy. What a horrible, horrible decision I made. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you get it? <laughs> he's going to just have a regular voice now. You get a good look at it? Was it foaming at the mouth? Prospector number two. Not that I could tell. Doc Murphy finishes with the bandage, and Prospector number two stands to go. Doc Murphy. All right, well, you should be fine. And let me know if your jaw tightens up or it gets hard to move over the next few days. Prospector number two. Why? Doc Murphy. You never know what these animals get into. A bite could still be dangerous long after it happens. Prospector number one. Can he work? Doc Murphy. Washing up. I wouldn't risk it, but I know you boys are chasing your fortunes. I can't stop you. The prospectors nod and exit. Doc Murphy. Claudette, I need you to send a telegram to my cousin in Abilene. Tell him to send my equipment. We may need to do a transfusion. Claudette nods and exits. Exterior. Doc Murphy's continuous. Claudette walks down the street and passes the Undertakers. The Undertaker helps Carl and Stan unload bodies from Carl's cart and bring them inside the building. Claudette winces when she sees a little girl's body in the cart. Exterior, train station platform. Minutes later, Claudette enters the train station office <clears throat> and through the window, she can be t seen t talking. <clears throat> Sorry. Claudette enters the train station office and through a window, she can be seen talking to the platform manager who writes down what she tells him. Outside, the train that, car that long robbed has arrived, and the bodies are being carried off. Carried off. <clears throat> Sarah cries as she watches while clinging to Jimmy. 
Father Espinoza, 50, performs last rites on the bodies as they're laid out on the station platform. Interior, jail, sunset. Long wakes, and his eyes shoot open. He tries to sit up quickly, but pain reminds him to move slowly. He checks his wounds and inspects his bandages. Satisfied, he looks up at the cell walls and bars. He sighs. Long. What now? After a moment, a match is struck, and the flame dips into the smoking pipe, revealing Everett's face in the darkness. Then he lights a lantern on the desk where he's sitting. Everett, now we wait. Tomorrow, assuming you'll survive the journey, I'll take you back up north to face a judge and jury. He puffs his pipe. And then, I will watch you die. Long picks himself up gingerly and sits on the cell bench. Long, is my death all you have to live for? Everett doesn't answer for a long time. Everett, I live for the law. And the law says you need to pay for what you've done. Long. The law. Your laws never protected me or my brother. Or my countrymen who died building your railroads. Where was the law when we were paid two-thirds of what a white man was paid? Where was the law when we were whipped by overseers and shackled, sorry, and shackled when we tried to leave? Where was the law when we went on strike to protest our treatment and the railroad company stopped feeding us? Finally, after eight days of starvation, the law came, but not to save us. The sheriff came with his deputies to threaten us if we did not return to work. Your laws never applied to me. Everett puffs on his pipe for a few moments. Everett. Whatever injustices you've suffered, that's no excuse for killing men. Well, that's no excuse for killing men, women, and children. Life isn't fair, and you can't make it fair by taking life. Only the law makes life fair, or as close to it as we can get. And that's why you have to die, to bring some fairness to this life. The two men stare at each other in silence. Okay, great. Wow, that was a bear to get through.